All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. Joshua chapter 40, no, 20. <laughs> Joshua chapter 20, as we continue. I, I think we've told you uh, several times, but it bears repeating that this entire book only takes 25 years. It starts at about 405 BC, runs through about 1380 or so. And, and the focus is very much the occupation of the land as the, the children of Israel, after years of waiting and delaying and punishment and all dragging their feet, finally get to enter the land of promise that God had given to them all the way back to Abraham, you know, nearly 500 years earlier. The early lessons of the preparation early on in the book of uh, we've gone through, when the children of Israel finally entered the land, God actually rolled the Jordan River up 16 miles upstream. Can you imagine? I mean, that was a pretty good how do you do. Everyone in town went, well, I guess they're here. And God gave them a pretty good entrance. They, they reinstituted the, uh, the practice of circumcision, which was the covenant that God had made with Abraham. They, they went back to the Passover, which really we can only find them have, having kept it one time in the last 40 years or so. And then they had these victories at Ai and Jericho, and there's very few battles that the Lord really sets before us. Um, but what he does do is he gives to us in chapters 10, 11, and 12 the, the major battles. And by major, I mean uh, the battles in the middle of the country to the north and in the south. And God had a way of putting these major cities together and, and coming collectively to challenge the children of Israel as they came in. Those are battles that took seven and a half years. We aren't really told much about them at all other than you know, we are given uh, kings that fell, 31 of them by name in chapter 12. Um, the, the strongholds were, were taken out, so much so that, that Joshua, who after seven and a half years um, is, is only 93, <laughs> is tired. I mean, he's tired. He can't go out and come in. He, he led the collective uh, battles against the enemies of God in the land for seven and a half years. It's always a good picture to me that, you know, the Lord has given them the land, but you've got to go fight for it. You've you got to stand with the Lord. You've got to stand and, and, and plant your feet. And, and that's true for us, too. You know, you can give in to worry or you can just give in to faith. You can trust the Lord and believe that he's good and he's for you. Or, or you can entertain the thoughts that he might not be for you. It's not true, but you can entertain those thoughts. And, and so Joshua would leave, live another 17 years, but beyond the battle years, but being worn out and it was a tough road to hoe, uh, the Lord directed him to divide the land to the people that in the various tribes and then to assign each tribe their area to clean out the enemy that the Lord wanted completely destroyed. Now you read the Bible, you go, oh my gosh, that seems so rough. Well, until you start reading what the Canaanites did for a living and how they went about doing life and Boy, you'd vote for them to be wiped out. The Lord waited for generations for them to, to come around. But in any event, it is, it is their, their lack of obedience to cleanse the land fully that would be that, that snake that came and bit them lay, later on, and, and quite, quite quickly at that. You know, you leave stuff in your life that isn't really from the Lord, that you bring in from the world, and, and you don't deal with it, man, it can, it can wipe you out. You can be doing so good in so many areas, and the enemy will find the weakness that, you know, that he'll exploit. So that certainly was true of them. But for now, at least to where we are in chapter 19, or, or through chapter 19, they're doing pretty well. I mean, they're, they're obeying the Lord. They're going where they're told to go. And uh, this generation knows both the Lord and his power, which isn't so true of the next generation. So tonight we want to finish the distribution of the land, chapter 20 and 21. Uh, then beginning next week, we, we are going to spend a whole week on one verse. And then for the next three weeks after that one chapter a week, there's some really good lessons at the end that I think bear us just slowing down. Because where, where are we going anyway? Or are you in a hurry to get done? So we're going to just spend, you know, spend a few weeks learning these wonderful lessons. But tonight we're going to look at the last tribe that really didn't have anything yet, the, the Levites. And, and you can call these two chapters cities of refuge and cities of residence. Because that is indeed what the Levites come to be. Now we'll learn a little bit about them tonight. But let me just say to you that the, the spiritual equivalent in our generation to the cities of refuge is the local church. It literally is the people of God planted in different communities that reach out to the communities to, to 
pass along, if you will, the word of God and the ways of God and to represent the Lord and, and to counsel from his word. There, there's probably no better parallel, really, than these cities that were planted throughout the land, which, which were filled with priests, godly men, or they were supposed to be, that would bear the, the, the Lord before the people. So that's our goal tonight. Cities of Refuge, chapter 20. Cities of Residence, chapter 21. You know, one of the most defining moments in the Wizard of Oz, you all see this movie? It's, it's, it's been around a little while. Was Dorky, Dorky, <laughs> I haven't seen that one. Was Dorothy, um, don't laugh at me, I had a stroke. Remember, you guys. I am okay, thank you. That she discovered there was no way to go, go back to Kansas, right? Wasn't that the big deal? Like, man, I can't go home. And she was frustrated, and, and she was in despair. I'm not going to tell you the story now, because you guys made fun of me. But she was finally told to close her eyes. Remember this? And click her heels together and say three times. Yeah, that's right. So you've seen this movie. Even in this magical place, right, where she found herself, she wanted to go home. And home wasn't all that pretty. It was dusty and flat. I'm pretty sure it was in black and white too, wasn't it? In the movie? No color at all, right? You just go to, the, to that black and white Kansas. But, but everyone takes, I think, pride in their home, right? Whether it's your hometown, where you're from, the city that you live in, you know, it brings back memories. And most cities, at least, well, for certainly most of the larger cities in the world have nicknames. And, and, and we know them. Some of them are more you know, obscure, but if I said the Big Apple, you'd say, very good. City of Angels? Easy. Sin City? That's correct. The Big Easy? Excuse me? Uh. <laughs> New Orleans. How about the Smoke? London? Or the Big Toe? Is Toronto. Well, see, so you, so you know some of them, right? Well, well, the children of Israel had special cities too. They were important to them. They, they were proud of them. It's where they lived. It's where they grew up. It's where their memories were uh, planted. And, and we've, we've looked at them. Actually, we've skipped their names because we don't know how to pronounce them or where a lot of times they were, except uh, geographically in, in areas. But, but these were important to them. It, it does interest me, and, and I don't know if it bothered you before, but it interests me that God gives to us in two chapters the creation of the heavens and the earth. I have a lot of questions. Two chapters, and it's over. And then I get here, and there are just chapter after chapter of land allotments and cities that don't exist and, and towns that I can't pronounce and, and borders, and, and yet they were home, no place like home. And, and it was. When, when Caleb came out, you know, before they began to divide the land up, Caleb cut off, uh, you know, Joshua as he was doling out the land as God was directing him through the, the casting of the lots. And before he ever let the, him help anybody, he says, hey, I want my part. <laughs> 45 years ago, Moses promised me that I could have that, that town of Hebron. And, and it's a place that was filled with giants and it had a mountain you had to climb. And, and Caleb was old, but he didn't care. You know, he wanted that for his family. It was home to him. He'd been hanging on to it for a longest time. When, when the land was all but distributed except for the Levites, it's Joshua, when they asked him what he wanted, that asked for a little town um, called Timnath Sarah in, in the mountains of Ephraim, rocky, rural, backward place. He, he didn't pick a, a town along the Mediterranean, which I might have picked, but he, no, he wanted to go up in the hills. So... As Dorothy said, there's no place like home. And if nothing else, the chapters that we've gone through, those big names and, and, and long ones and unpronounceable ones, look, this was home, man. And, and, this, and the Lord brought his people home. This was the land that he had prepared. This was the, the place he had promised for, for the better part of four or 500 years. You know, it was a place that he wanted them to stay. It's a place that Israel is back in the land today. They're not there, back there thriving because they're godly. They're not godly people for the most part. They're secular folks that have a religion. One day they'll meet the Lord and they'll have all kinds of godliness, but they don't have that yet. But they are there because God is faithful to his promises. So tonight as we look at, at 
two different kinds of homes. We find these cities that were planted by the Lord as, as refuge cities. They have a specific function, as does the church. And then they were cities of residence where these Levites from the tribe of Levi would live. And both of the cities somehow related in their relationship to God by their function as to what God has called them to do. So let's start chapter 20, verse 1. It said, The Lord then spoke to Joshua, and he said, Now speak to the children of Israel and say, Appoint for yourself cities of refuge of, of, about which I spoke to you through Moses, so that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and, there you shall be, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. If you've been with us since we started back in Genesis, uh, the Pentateuch, these first five books that Moses wrote, um, established in God's word a law of these cities that he would establish in the land once they got there called cities of refuge. They are mostly mentioned in Numbers 35 and Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 19. They are described in verse 3 very accurately. They were a place that if you accidentally killed someone or you didn't have the intention and you were involved in their death, it was a place that you could run within the city walls, within you know, designated boundaries, to get a fair hearing. You, you would arrive, and, and, and as you arrived, you would, you would be given you know, a clearance or, or at least a fair hearings. And, and it addressed something that isn't just Jewish, but, but the whole idea of Goelism. <laughs> It was a, a practice that most ancient societies practice. And, and the word goalism literally means that there was an obligation on the part of, of the next of kin to someone who had died or to somebody who had suffered loss to, to make that loss good. Whether it meant that you lost land because you, you know, squandered your money or you lost your freedom because you couldn't pay your debt. But it was that issue of going as a next of kin to redeem someone who had lost what they once had, but certainly couldn't recover. And if you lost them under certain conditions, they would work for your, you know, your gain of it, to gain it back. They would be surety or pay for you. In some cultures, when it came to retribution, which is what this is all about, it was obligatory. For example, if one of yours was killed... <laughs> It, you were obligated by, by social law, if nothing else, to go and shed the blood of the assailant. You, you would go get your pint of blood. You would go make things right. You, you see it in, in, in gang life in the streets. You know, you kill one of ours, we'll kill one of yours. It, it's the old eye for an eye. And, and the law it isn't just found in, in, the, in the annals, if you will, of the Pentateuch, where God makes it very clear how and what. But it is entrenched in ancient civilizations. We just get even. That's what we do. We, we t protect ourselves. The problem, of course, is the minute you start to practice an eye for an eye, it doesn't take long for you to become unjust. And by unjust, I mean, you know, you take out one of my teeth, I'm going to knock out three of yours. Because that's kind of the way we, we see things going, right? We, we, we want to, to up the ante. We want to, to, to make sure that we get our, ours and then some. Um, in, in the law of God, there is what was established. Uh, the the uh, Latin words are lex talionis, but it literally means an eye for an eye. But it was the, the limitations by God upon a ancient people that were his, limiting, if you will, their ability to repay. So you were limited to an eye. <laughs> I want to give an eye for an eye. If you add to that the fact that this angry, you know, member of the family whose brother, let's say, is killed, cannot possibly know all of the circumstances surrounding the death of his brother. He only knows he's dead. And in that emotionally packed kind of situation, you know, you're going to go try to get even. You're not going to go fulfill the law of God. You're just going to go fulfill the law of the land. And, and if it happened to have been involuntary manslaughter or a complete accident or it had been self-defense, um, you know, add to that great emotional distress and family loyalty, and, and you're liable to kill an innocent man because that's just the way we do things around here. And so uh, when it came to God's law, he, he clearly differentiates liability in terms of uh, culture, uh, manslaughter, 
uh, or, or not under certain s situations. Uh, Exodus 21 and 22, good place to look. There's those whole, the, that whole list of, of capital punishment offenses that if they can be proven and there are witnesses that, you know, the, the Bible doesn't back away from capital punishment as a, as a deterrent as well as a punishment, but, but it, it is regulated, not like the world regulates, but by the, by the spirit that, of, of God that, that seeks to raise up a people. So if you, for example, go back and read Numbers 35, the, the encouragement to someone involved in one of those issues is to run as quick as you can to the, one of these cities of refuge, and you'll be protected in the city, according to the law of God, by the rash or the, or the kind of premature actions of the avenger, and you can stay there safely until your trial is heard, and then we're going to read as we continue that, that if you're declared innocent, you can stay there safely until the high priest dies. You shouldn't leave until then, but when he dies, you're not only welcome to go home if you like, the avenger has no more right to deal with you, and you're free. So that was the law of God being imposed upon ancient society, if you will, and the way that they would practice. So th these, um, these cities of refuge were, were meant to bring order and fairness and equality and, and equity to God's people. They were exercised in a manner where there was no personal, if you will, or, or the idea of personal revenge was, was taken away, right? If you get through the Bible, you realize that the state, for example, is never asked by God to be merciful. The state is asked to be fair. Judgment of the state is, is impersonal. It's not designed to get themselves involved. It's to, it's to regulate uh, and to enforce law. When it comes to you, individually, you're, ter you're told to turn the other cheek and to, to forgive 70 times seven. You have an obligation as, a, as, as one who's benefited from God's grace to be gracious, to be forgiving, to, be, to die to self. But the law and the state aren't asked to do that. They're, if there's a, a law of, of capital punishment, that they, they apply it without bias because they're not supposed to be gracious or merciful. They're supposed to be representative of the law. It protects you, if you will. And, and it certainly was the same in, in this kind of situation. So, you know, if you were found innocent, they would protect you. You could stay there and the guy can't come in, <laughs> you know, and, and you're, you're good. Once the high priest dies, you can, you're free to go home. The avenger is not allowed to touch you or he'll be guilty. But if you go to the city of refuge and you're found to be guilty, they'll just kill you. They'll just kill you. You'll, you'll, you'll find that there's execution for the crime. Well, verse 4 tells us that when he flees to one of these cities, he stands at the entrance to the gate of the city. He declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city. They will take him into the city as one of them. They will give him a place that he might dwell among them. And if this avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, not, nor did not, not hate him beforehand. And he will dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the, of the one who was the high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and, and, and come to his own city and to his own house and to the city from which he fled. So... The elders of the city, and, and by the way, because we are now with the Levites, as we are reading, all of the elders in the city are priests, right? Now, we, we know from, uh, not this place, but from other places, um, that there were 48 cities that the Levites were given by the Lord throughout the land. Remember he said, it's kind of like the church being planted in neighborhoods to provide spiritual direction. God planted them everywhere. In fact, if you get a map out, and maybe I should have brought you one, most of the cities of the Levites were in the south where all of the big population centers were. There were less as you went north, there were less as you went east. But, but they were designed to be the, the, the word and the name of the Lord, the, the, the word of God, if you will, through these cities to, to the nation and to the people. Um, there were uh, 30, uh, sorry, 48 of them. Six of them were deemed to be these cities of refuge. Uh, in, chapter, in verse 7 and I think verse 8, it's, we read, now these, so they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, in the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, Kerjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah, and on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. So 
across the Jordan again. They assigned Bezer in the wilderness and the plains from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These are the cities that were appointed for all of the children of Israel and for the strangers who dwell among them, that whoever would kill a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he was able to stand before the congregation. So six cities were deemed refuge cities. Three in the land, three on the other side of the Jordan. They were spaced pretty evenly in the north and the center of the country and in the south. They, they were designed that way so that there could be easy access. Um, those who were sitting in the gates that would hear your appeal, your case, if you will, were all Levites that by, by definition would be men that were interested in God's will, that would know the law of God, that would apply it fairly, that would be impartial in their judgment. But notice from verse 6 that these cities would afford safe haven for the innocent, fair trial, protection under the law. And, um, and then you, could, you had to stay in the city until the high priest died, which is interesting because if you came and you laid out your case and let's say they found you innocent and the high priest was 35 years old, you might have to move your whole family into this town and stay there for quite some time before that you were able to leave. But in verse 7, notice on the west side of the Jordan, there's a place called Kadesh. That's in the north. Shechem is in the center of the country. Kirjath Arba, or Hebron, is in the south. Verse 8, on the east side, Bezer is in the south. Ram, Ramoth is in the middle. And the Golan is in the north. So they were strategically placed. And if you, again, can just look at them on a map, you will notice that there, you couldn't be anywhere in the land of Israel as God gave it to them where you'd be more than four hours away from a city or about half a day's journey. If you really had to get somewhere, it would take you less than half a day to arrive at one of these cities so that you could find protection and oversight. Um, in, in a spiritual sense, certainly the, the cities of refuge are, are a picture of Jesus and, and what he came to do. You know, the, the avenger of blood is the, the judgment for our sin. We need a, a savior. We run to him. He's, he's ever present and certainly available. Um, and we're made free because the, the high priest has died for us. In fact, the, the book of Hebrews is all about the high priest, right? Being our, our mediator and, and being the one that will, will intercede for us. That, that would be the one that would brought, bring us in. So, so you get these pictures now of these cities. Not land. It's not... Not like the other ones we've read where they get a big chunk of land. The, the, Hebrew, I mean, the uh, Levites would just get cities kind of all scattered throughout the territories of the, of the Jews. Uh, a couple of interesting, I think, um, comparisons that you can make between um, Jesus so ever ready to save you and these cities of refuse is that these cities, these six, were always accessible of all of the, the cities in the land that had walls around them and gates, everyone locked their doors at night, including the city. They, they would shut them at sundown. You didn't get in, you couldn't get out unless you were a city of refuge. And then you could come 24 hours a day. It's the only people, the only place open 24 seven, right? They were available to you. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 19, the Lord very clearly through Moses demands that all of the roads in the land leading to these cities of refuge had to be groomed and well-maintained so that no one would have trouble getting to that place of grace. And not only that, but that there would be large signs pointing the way. You wouldn't get in the middle of the desert and go, I wonder which way it is, because you're running for your life. It had to be clearly marked, easily found. In fact, the, 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 the Talmud spoke about even the bridges that were built in the valleys, so when there was flooding, the people could still have great success finding a place of escape and they weren't restricted, and it was a place that were easy to find, which is kind of like Jesus, right? He's always open. He's always available. You're, you're in trouble tonight, you can go to him. I think sometimes, I'm just trying to make that comparison in my mind, I think sometimes we as the church make it harder for people to find the Lord than easier. I mean, everything the law said, make it easy. Make it easy for them to find a place. Make it easy for them to get to that place of refuge. And I think sometimes we make, we make it hard on people, right? We, 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 we demand of them things that, that God doesn't we demand. We, we, we make stipulations for his mercy and we add works to his grace. And it's almost like we hinder the people. We stand in the way of them rather than inviting them to come and find life with the Lord. 
So the, the Old Testament said to the Jews, keep the roads clear, keep the signposts up, make it definitive where he is and make him easy to get to, or make it easy to get to that place. So for us, so the, the cities were accessible. Number one, they were accessible. He was always available uh, to them. Um, what is that scripture in, in Revelation? And the spirit and the bride say, come, right? Just come. If you're thirsty, come. If you desire, come. The, the water of life is free. Come and get it. Revelation, I think it's 22, 6, 17, but it, it's in the last chapter, I'm pretty sure. So they're always available. Uh, notice verse 9, it said that the, the, the cities would be open to everyone, which is another thing that Jesus says. He's available to everyone. Notice it's not just the Jews. It's the Jews and the stranger alike that live in their midst. The city was universal in its ability to receive and, and to protect. So is Jesus. Doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, where you came from, who you know or don't know. Doesn't matter. You go to the Lord and he'll receive you. Come anytime you like and he'll receive you. Come on to me if you're thirsty and drink. John says in chapter 6, he will never turn us away if we come. So all these beautiful pictures of the things that the Lord would, would, would do for us. And, and you might add to the comparison, these cities were exceptional. By that I mean it is the only place in the land that you could run and be protected. They're exceptional. They stand out. There's no place else to go. It wasn't like here's a city of refuse or there was no or. You know, you might say, well, I think I'll just go home. I like my place better. Well, you can stay home, but there's no security there. So Jesus is exceptional, right? He's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You, you, you can choose another way, but you'll die. In fact, if you go to Hebrews, and, and there's that, that portion in chapter 6 of Hebrews where it talks about God made a promise to Abraham, and because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. I swear on my own. I'm God. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. I, I'll, I'll bless you and, and multiply you. But then as you get down to the, I think, verse 18 of, of Hebrews chapter 6, it says there are two immutable things that God gave us where it's impossible for him to lie and in which we can have strong consolation. And then it says, who have fled to him for refuge with the hope that's set before us. It's almost the, the description of, of this whole function of the city. We have run to Jesus for refuge by his, by his grace, by his mercy. So you, you find it here as well. He, he's our refuge. Jesus is our refuge. What, what is that old song? How firm a foundation you sing to the Lord is, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Right? How firm a foundation. There's a line in that hymn that, that says the soul that, the soul that upon Jesus has leaned for repose, I will, not, I will not forsake to his foes. And that soul that all hell would determine to shake, I will not, no, never, no, never forsake. So that's God's promise. Here to his people as well, in, in the economy of God's government, he establishes this practice. Um, now, Lest I go crazy with types. Types are good in the general sense in the Bible, which means that they reflect something that we could understand. The minute you get in trouble when you try to push types too far, and sometimes people will do that. For example, I'll just give you this to think about. The cities of refuge were helpful only for the innocent. Really, the only, the only people that benefited were people that were innocent. If you show they're up there guilty, you're done. They're not a good place for you. Jesus, on the other hand, is only good for the guilty. You know, if you're sick, if you need a doctor, okay, then you can come. But the Lord said, if you don't know you're sick, I can't do you any good, right? Jesus is only for the guilty and not for those who think that they're innocent. So here's God's graciousness applied in, in, in practical terms, in terms of, of the government, in, in the issue of justice and the avenger. And it really does slow down personal vengeance and, and, and raises it to a level almost of government operation where there's no personal involvement. You know, we go to a lot of hospital calls. We do a lot of funerals with the police department. We'll get called out on, uh, as chaplains, at least in Santa Ana, on some pretty grisly and, and horrifying things. But you're better able to handle it if you're not 
emotionally involved. I mean, it's horrendous, but it's not your father. It's not your children. It's not, so you have this, this, it's almost there's that space of protection for you, right? When you go to serve. Same way when it comes to government versus personal responsibility. The government, it just has to be just. (laughs) The individual has to be merciful and and, and to forgive as God forgave you. So, um, let the Lord avenge, let the Lord set it right, take it out of the hand of the individual, limit the, the personal you know, vengeance that can get very much out of hand, and it is the government's job to punish evildoers, and for you, it's just to love people and, and pray for them and, and seek to reach them. But that's the wisdom of God here in utilizing these uh, cities of refuge. And to, you know, to the extent that the people used them, they were blessed. God used it to bless. Uh, It it removed uh, emotional assaults, it moved injustice, it removed personal vengeance, took it all out of the equation and and laid it back upon the the people that represented the Lord. Well, chapter 21, and and you're going to be just fine because about 40 of those verses we're not going to read. So you that are clock watchers, don't worry. Like I said, there are 48 cities allotted to the tribe of Levi in which they were allowed to dwell amongst the children of Israel. Most of them, as I told you, were on the west side, not on the east where most of the folks lived. Most of them were in the south, away from the sparsity of the northern populations, if you will. And and more so when you got to Jerusalem where God would eventually, after Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle stands now, but but that's where he would move it that place of worship, right? When David would overthrow the Jebusites in Jerusalem um, in 1040 or so, then that that tabernacle of worship will be moved. So another 320, 40 years, 340 years, it'll be moved to Jerusalem. So you find that God places a lot of these cities kind of in those areas. Some of them, you would have had to guess on your own that Jerusalem was gonna be thriving in in a religious center, but God knew that already and he positions them Um, accordingly. In the tribes, or or for the sake of, you know, these folks have finally come home to their land, um, there was a tremendous benefit for them to be near a Levitical city. If you needed biblical counseling, they spent their lives learning the Bible. If you needed an interpretation of the law so it could be applied in your relationship in in a social setting, you could find it there. The priests, the Bible teachers, the, the, the students of the word of God were all dwelling in these cities. It was a whole place to just go, help me, teach me, show me. And, and in that regard, it really becomes a, a reflection, I think, of the local church ministry. Um, everyone that was trained for ministry in the priesthood went to Shiloh. That's where they had to go. And they would eventually then be sent out to all of these places and they would come once a year in their course, as David would set it up later, to serve. But, but this is, so, so if you had a whole you know, city next to you filled with men of God and, and people that love God's word, man, you could have a great benefit in, in going there. Um, I think that's the importance of picking a church to be involved with that's teaching the Bible. Verse one says this, then the heads of the fathers of the Levites came near to Eleazar the high priest at the time, to Joshua, the son of Nun, and to the, all of the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spoke to them there at Shiloh in the land of Canaan. And they said, the Lord commanded through Moses to us cities to dwell in where there could be common land for our livestock. So the children of Israel gave to the Levites from their inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their common lands. Shiloh was the first capital, really, of the new land. It is where the Lord put his name. If you had your map from last week, it is in the mountains of Ephraim, pretty much in the middle of the country, maybe a little to the north. And until David would come upon the scene and make Jerusalem the capital, this was the place that, that they would come to worship. Every person would have to come here to worship. And you weren't allowed to build your own altar, do your own thing. You had to come here because the, the issue was the, you know, the heathen have altars everywhere because they worship a million gods. The Jews were, were ones that worship one God. So he was in one place. That was really the, the, the way to learn and, and to be taught. So they went to one place. Uh, the Levites, according to the word of God, were not given any land at all, 
but they were to be given by the various tribes and suburbs places to live in. They were the, like I said, the biblical equivalent or spiritual equivalent of, I think, the local church today. And uh, they were there to help out. Now, from, from the stand of, of church today, the U.S. government does not obligate us as Morningstar to pay property taxes as a church. We're off the hook for property taxes. Um, because it all began with there was value in having a church in a community that would take care of the poor, teach the Bible, provide schooling so oftentimes, but it was, it was that positive influence for years that they saw the church. Uh, if you go to the city today and ask to move into a city, you might very well find just the opposite is to be true. They really don't care about your positive influence. They're interested in money. And since you're a nonprofit not paying taxes, you're at the bottom of the list when it comes to favor or, or, or to find favor. And so, you, you know, churches that have to move around or, or, or need to move at all find themselves oftentimes up against revenue and, and no, nobody necessarily on a city council or a, a group of folks will value the work of Jesus in a community. They don't see those benefits. They just see no money. You're sitting on land, we're not getting paid. We don't need you here, go away. In fact, we, we years ago were trying to move into another city nearby, I won't even tell you who it is, but you can guess it's nearby. And, and they said to us, verbatim, we don't want any churches in our town, we need people that pay their taxes. And we went, well, all right. But there's a great benefit to have you and I as Christians in a community sharing Jesus. None of you are breaking and entering. No, no liquor stores are being robbed. No drunk drivers are crashing in and killing folks unnecessarily. I'd, I'd like to have a lot of churches in my community, wouldn't you? Just people that love Jesus, but they don't see it. And, and they just see you as, as a problem uh, that is getting away with not paying your taxes. Um, notice from verse 1 and 2 that, that the request um, came from the Levites to the leadership and they did so obediently, believing what God had said to them earlier when Moses was still around, that when they got into the land, they would be given from the tribes places that they could live and also places that they could raise their uh, livestock around them, if you will. So that request, prompted by obedience, was what gave them 48 towns, 42 of them throughout the land, six of them cities of refuge, and common land around them, um, so it was really God's way of reaching out to every community with his word, right? It was the Lord's hand of grace. One of the lessons that, that we learned from the Levites in particular, just the tribe, if you remember back in Genesis 49, Jacob is dying and he prophesies over his 12 children of which obviously Levi was one. And he mentions Simeon and Levi there in verse, I think it's chapter 49, verse 5, 6, and 7 in that area. But he mentions both Simeon and Levi as being cruel in their, I think he called them cruel in your dwelling place, um, and then saying that they would be divided in Jacob and scattered in Israel. So he said of these two boys that would become tribes, you're really not going to have your own place. You're going to be scattered. You're going to be divided. You're not going to find yourself exactly where you are. And the whole situation came out because they were in Shechem at the time when their sister Dinah was, was violated by some of the men, or I think actually one of the le leaders, rulers in the town. And, and the boys wanting to protect their sister uh, try to make peace, or they try, or the, the offenders, I think, family try to make peace. And and they said, well, yeah, if all the boys get circumcised like we, the Jews, do, then we could probably forgive that. And the minute these men were incapacitated by that surgery, they went in and killed everyone. And, and it not only put Jacob in a dangerous place with his family, but it was just, it was really a violation of, of the Lord's goodness, if you will. And, and Jacob didn't forget it. So the prophecy bore out because Simeon, if you look at your map from last week, got stuck in Judah. They didn't get their own land. They got stuck in Judah's land because it was too much for them. They didn't have any borders. They were protected by Judah, but they, they were just kind of floating around, if you will. They didn't have their own place. And Levi, the priestly scribe, is also scattered. Now, it started as a curse, but it turned into a blessing. Isn't that something? Their, their worst, 
that they have done and the Lord dealt with them, God then turned it around into a blessing. Only God can do that. I'm not suggesting that you ever mess up really bad so God's curse can be a blessing. I'm just saying, if you've messed up really bad and you feel like God is dealing with you, God can turn even that around. You know, you look to him, he can make the worst of, of what you've done turn out for good. He can turn it around. Not suggesting that's the road that you take, but if you're on that road already, it's good to know that the Lord can turn you around, and he did. Now, in, in Numbers chapter, I think, 35, it says that the common land around every, each one of these cities was 500 yards out from the, from the border of the town. So literally, in, in, in every direction around the round town, 500 yards, they got to keep their animals uh, around. Just to kind of give you a feel for what that meant, all of the 48 cities of the Levites only measured 15 square miles completely. The land, all that they had, 15 square miles, which is about one-tenth of one percent of all of the land that at this point Israel would feel, was filling up. So it wasn't a huge port, very small by comparison, um, but they were uh, responsible for you know, the spiritual well-being, I think, of, of the people. And, and to the extent that they, they brought God's word forth and, and worship, things did well. And when, when the people turned away and the priests fled, you know, then the, the nation suffered. In the tribe of Levi, if you remember it all from uh, our studies before, uh, there were basically three families that, be, that, that formed the, the tree of the Levites to which God gave responsibilities, all having to do with the the transport and service, the setup and the worship at the place of, of, of meeting with God at the tabernacle, right? Uh, and, and he assigned these two families uh, responsibility. Numbers three, there's great detail that it offered about all, all of those things. But, but needless to say, these guys were responsible in one way or another to bring the people and God together in a way that God had... Uh, uh, Authorized One of the groups was called the, the Gershonites, and, and they were the ones that would camp when they were moving on the west side of the uh, tabernacle. They were responsible for all of the soft goods. By that I mean uh, the, the, the veils, the curtains. They had to fold them and clean them and transport them and set them up the next place they stopped. It stopped really having to be done once they settled down. There was a group from uh, the family of the Merorites who camped to the north, they were kind of the heavy lifters. They were all the, the Samoan big guys, you know. They, they carried poles and, and, and fences and stakes. They, they, were, they were big dudes, right? And then there was the Kohathites, the third family. For the high priest came from there. They camped in the south. They were responsible for everything in the holy place and in the holy of holies. They, they were responsible for the, for the things that really were holy, if you will, the altar of incense and the candelabra and the ark itself. Um, so, as you read through this, and we're not going to read all of them, but notice in verse 4, it says, the, the lot fell upon the family of the Kohathites, and then we are given uh, the cities that the Kohathites were given in verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Uh, I'll summarize them for you. They were given 23 cities by lot, 13 in the south in, in Judah, where the temple would be built, 10 of them in the north. In verse 6, there is the mention of the children of, the, of Gershon. Um, the Gershonites were given 10, sorry, 12 cities. The Merorites in verse 7 were given 13. And then beginning in verse 9 and reading all the way to verse 40, you are given by name those 48 cities. If you thought I was going to read them to you, you're dead wrong. <laughs> I would just mark the chapter as a reference page so when you run into these things, you can come back and, and understand what you're dealing with because I trust the Lord gave them to us to understand fully what he is doing. And, and throughout the Old Testament, you're gonna read about the priests and the, those three families and what, and, and what happened in some of these cities of refuge. So it's good for you to know and uh, hopefully you'll remember it that way as an overview. Verse 41 says, and all of the cities of the Levites within the possession of the children of Israel were 48 cities with their common lands. Each one of these cities had its common lands surrounding it. These were all of the city. So God had 470 years earlier roughly said to Abraham as, 
as Lot had separated from him, look around. Every place your eye lands, north and south, east and west, this is all going to belong to you and to your descendants, and I'll make them as the dust of the earth for number, and no one will be able to number them, and you can walk through the land. I'm going to give this to you. And, and really, this is fulfilled here in the sense that you know, God has established the land, the people, the places of worship, the oversight of, of the, the meeting place between he and his people. He is with them in the land. He, he is at the center of their worship. And God, 470 years earlier, had said, this will be yours. And, and there you go. They're all in the land. They're all in their place. It's all been allotted, if you will, and nothing is left to be given to them. Verse 30, uh, 43 says, So the Lord gave to Israel, and notice these words, all of the land which he had swore to give to, his fa- to their fathers, and they took possession of it, and they dwelt in it. The, the Lord's promise of the land. Uh, he had kept his promise, in fact, one of the things that I wrote in my margin in my Bible years ago was every, th- every promise God made, he kept. Every promise they made, they broke. That's absolutely true. I, think, I don't think you can argue with that. I don't want that to be our testimony, but it usually is. You know, God's always faithful. We are always trying. And God is good. He keeps his word. So he gave them the land. So we're given by the Lord peace and, and rest and, and salvation if we fall short of peace and rest, it's not his fault, right? You know that. You agree? Not his fault. Because he's made it available. We just need to now, you know, hang on to it, possess it, appropriate it, and believe him. Notice verse 44. It says, and he gave them rest all around. He gave them all of the land, and he gave them rest all around. Or literally, the enemies that were left posed no threat to them at all. The accomplishment of taking the entire lamb should have, at this point, been relatively easy. The problem was they didn't heed his word, and leaving these pockets of enemies, these pockets began to grow, their influence began to grow. And it's amazing. My, my mother used to say to me, I don't want you hanging around with that kid. And, and I'd always go, well, what's wrong with him? But, but I knew what was wrong with him. He's like the worst kid in the block. But, but I liked hanging out with him because he's the worst kid in the block. And, and my, you're going to start acting just like he does. Or you've been hanging around that because you're talking just like he does. And I thought, how does she know? But it's the case, right? You, you hang around in the world, you become like the world. You hang around with church folks, you become hopefully godly and, and, and loving the Lord. So he gave them the land, A. He gave them rest, B. And then we read, verse 45, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. Everything came to pass. That's pretty cool, right? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Next week, Lord be willing, I'd like to spend the whole evening with you on that verse. I'd like to bring you a list of what God promises you. That'd be all right? So you can go home and go, I'm hanging on to these. I think you'll come to the same conclusion. God continues to be faithful. So this is really the end of the book in the sense that um, the land's been distributed, the priests have been planted, the cities have been chosen, the folks have been sent out away from the center of Shiloh where they would return to worship. Chapter 22 just speaks about a really bad incident where the folks who were living on, or wanted to live on the other side of the Jordan, now leave after seven and a half years of fighting. All right, we helped you, now we're leaving. And the terrible misunderstanding that happened between brethren because these guys decided to live far, far away from the Lord and far, far away from the people of God. And it's, it's a problem, it's an issue. And, and it is there for just, I think, that one purpose. You know. So we're gonna talk in chapter 22 specifically about how we avoid misunderstandings because it's a great lesson. Chapter 23 is Joshua speaking to the leadership. This is his last words and testament, if you will. And then chapter 24, he gathers the leadership along with the people and gives them his last words. And you know, part of those last words were, you know, choose you this day who you're gonna serve. As for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. But he was 110. So I think he was talking about everybody right before he dropped dead. Yeah, we're all gonna do it. <laughs> Left it with them. So that's what we have left before we look at the book of Judges. 
Father, thank you tonight as we sit together for your word to us. It's, it's important, Lord, that we, we read through some of these lists of cities and places and, and really pray, Lord, that you would speak to us about what they mean to us, what, what we should learn from them. Certainly, we can't memorize the verses and the names, but we don't want to miss the, 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 the comparisons between you know, the government that you set up in our lives, the, the, the function of the church and, and the, the function of these cities of refuge, or for that matter, the cities of these Levites, and more so, maybe the, the cities of refuge, Lord, is, is a good picture of what we, we received when we ran to you for refuge, as we read there in Hebrews 6.18. You, you were the one that we could go to to hide from judgment and find life and be declared innocent because of your blood. So as we sit together tonight, may, may these chapters and, and your words, Lord, move our hearts. We're so thankful for what you've begun in us. We pray that we as a church, as a people, a, a body, would have great influence on in our community. That, that, that Lord, the, even the, though the city governments may not see value in, in, in a group of people sitting on a piece of property where they're not paying property tax, may they see the great benefit from having godly men and women in their towns, in their, in their businesses, on the streets, and being that example for you, that you would use us in these last days. If, if tonight you find yourself in need of counsel, talk to one of the pastors up front. They're pretty good at their Bibles. You know, I trust every one of them when it comes to just getting the Bible out and talking to you about what the Bible teaches. And they'll show you. They'll help you to understand it. So come ask. Better you ask than not. And then also, you know, if you just need prayer, prayer. maybe you're away from the Lord. You've moved very far away. The good news is, no matter how much we've messed up, as we said, the Lord has a way of bringing us back, doesn't he? He can turn our, our, our greatest flubs into, into victory for him and for us. So come and pray. If you don't know Jesus personally, then come and talk to these guys and tell them, hey, I don't know if I know the Lord really like I should. Because he's, he's the only one. He's unique. He's open 24 hours a day ready to save, ready to forgive. He's open to everyone. He's exceptional. There's none like him. He's the only one that you can call on and find life. So come and do that tonight. And I know the Lord will meet you here. Shall we stand together tonight? At the end of our study through Joshua, a couple of four weeks or so, we're going to have Don Stewart here on a Wednesday night. We're going to just do Bible Answer Man with you guys. So we think that'll be fun. I think it's the last... I want to say the last Wednesday in June, I believe communion night in June, so hope you'll join us for that as well.